Ivan Pavlenko from Family to Family, Chapter 4, Part 2.7, Lichane, read by Natalia Buzova. Last year's meeting with Alexeyeva came to mind. What will she tell me now? But at first I ended up not with her, but with the party personnel department. This is how the head of the department, Peroshka, received me. He cut the package, pulled out the company documents and began to get acquainted with them, and at the same time with me. He reread and clarified each column in the questionnaire. He especially carefully looked at those records that were related to my time in the captivity. And at the end, he pulled out a blank bypass sheet from the closet and made a note on it. I didn't know what exactly he wrote. It is possible that the personal data had been checked and that negative or questionable information had been found in it. After that, he put all my documents in a bag and handed them to the instructor. And he took me to the head of the propaganda and agitation department, Alexeyeva, my main future boss. So the prodig prodigal son appeared again she greeted me either jokingly or reproachfully. I came for her repentance and corrections. I answered in the same tone. He called me. Kravchuk called. She drawled her words importantly. He praised you and asked me to help with your approval. After such an introduction, Alexeva began to study my personal file. First, she picked up the bypass letter, read the conclusion of the HR department, and, as it seemed to me, frowned. Then she read and clarified, like Piroshko, every entry in the questionnaire and autobiography. Finally, she picked up the bypass sheet several times and put it back on the table. Obviously, she hesitated about what to write there. Finally, she said, you are suitable for us both in terms of education and work experience, and your characterization is excellent. But frankly speaking, there is one but. With it, we will go to the secretary of the regional committee, Shvidak. Whatever he decides, so it will be. I understood what that but was. But although it was unpleasant and offensive for me, it still did not bother me very much. After all, from newspaper publications and statements by Khrushchev himself, it was assumed that former prisoners of war, especially those wounded in battle, were rehabilitated. It was no coincidence that I had been reinstated into the party with my previous experience. In addition, I did not worry about my tomorrow as it had been in the first post-war years when I had not been given any work. Now I had an education and the profession of a teacher, so I would not be left without a piece of bread. If earlier I had tried to advance in my career, now it was the opposite. I was invited, but I refused any leadership position. So with my, as they say, goodness, I didn't ask for anything. Alexeyev led me to the second floor and stopped at one point in front of an oak door. She told me to wait, and she went into the office. I was sitting in the corridor for probably 10 minutes and remembered how in Stalin's times they had carefully checked candidates for responsible positions, especially party ones. If this procedure took place in the district, then the instructor of the district party committee began to formalize the case. Then it was transferred to the head of the department and then to one of the secretaries of the district committee. After this, the case was transferred to the regional party committee and a similar procedure went through it there. Each person made his own entry in the bypass letter for which he was responsible. If, for example, an instructor or the head of a department did not see something, then a superior would reprimand him for political myopia and loss of vi vigilance. In the 30s, you could pay with your head for such a crime. 
Fear gave rise to the so-called fighters for the purity of party ranks, slanderers, informers, reinsurers. Finally, the door opened, and I was invited into the office of the secretary of the regional party committee, Swedak. He responded to my greeting with just his lips, and when I sat down opposite him, he prickly narrow his prickly narrowed eyes ran over me like evil demon, demons. The questions he asked me were unpleasant, sarcastic, and even insulting. There was a desire in them to catch me for something, accuse me, and on this basis not to allow me to work in party bodies. It was as if you were not in the office of the regional committee secretary, but under interrogation by the KGB. Here are some of his questions and my answers. How could you, a military school cadet, be captured alive by the Nazis? He asked sarcastically, staring into my eyes with his prickly gaze. This question tormented me terribly, I spoke in response, especially in the first days of captivity. Really, how could this have happened to me? I was such a guy that it seemed that even a bullet wouldn't catch me. But in the battle, I didn't even have a rifle. And I rushed to enemy positions with grenades, hoping to get a German machine gun in the night battle. But I was seriously wounded and came to my senses already in captivity. Why didn't you escape from captivity like real patriots did, he continued. Because you can't get far on crutches, I answered. Many soldiers and commanders died in captivity. Why did you manage to survive? Shvedak did not ask, but kind of accused or expressed suspicion. I also wanted to die more than once, I admitted frankly, but for some reason death bypassed me. Maybe I was a three core man. That's why I survived. But I don't see my fault in this. Those were the types of questions asked of me. And I realized that he was not interested in my knowledge, outlook, or experience. For him, first of all, I was a stranger and therefore should not infiltrate the leading party bodies. Stalin was no longer there. But the Stalinists remained. Even in the new conditions, they carefully guarded their caste environment, their privileges and unlimited rights. And the noise around the personality cult of Stalin, which they raised throughout the world, was a forced self-justification for millions of victims, a tactical move in further strengthening their leadership and guiding role. Alexeyeva was sitting silently on the side and every now and then glanced at me, then at Shvedak. Her face was impassive. She was obviously accustomed to such manifestations of lust for power and cynicism in relationships down to those whom he despised and whom he took pleasure in mocking. Having thus sprinkled salt on my frontline wounds, Shvedak finally calmed down a little and even showed concern about my future fate. Go, he said, and calmly work at school. We'll wait with the district committee. The administrative unification of the districts is expected, and the need for ideological personnel will probably resolve itself. I left the regional committee and took a deep breath of fresh air. And when leaving home by bus, I made living for home by bus, I made a vow to myself not to end up in this cast armhouse again. Thank God that everything remained the same, work, family, household, no sudden changes, no unnecessary hassle. The next day, I went to the district committee to see Vlasenka. He greeted me friendly and immediately informed me that Alexeyeva had called. She seemed to have a good opinion of me, but the districts were expected to be consolidated. So the solution to this personnel issue would have to wait.